morning, and uh, it's always fun to learn something new. We are going to be heading towards Easter as we talk about elements of Easter. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the book of Exodus, and specifically some of the things surrounding the Exodus itself, and how those things set the stage for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How Exodus actually foreshadows what Jesus does on the cross for us. So what is an element? Well, an element is an essential part. It's breaking it down to the very essence where it couldn't be broken down any further. And so we're going to learn some truths this morning and over the next few weeks as we look at the Exodus as a whole, as we look at the Passover, as we look at the sacrificial lamb, and the Lord's Supper, how that was instituted as a representation of the, of, with the Passover meal. So today we're going to be taking a look at the book of Exodus and kind of getting an overview of the story as we get into this. But before we go much further, I want to dispel a myth. You see, one of my favorite shows of all time is the show Mythbusters. And I can watch, when they have a marathon of that thing on, I can just sit and watch it all day long. I love watching Mythbusters. Because what do they do? They take commonly held ideas and they put them to the test. They test them out, they experiment, and see if these ideas are actually true or if in fact they are a myth. And so there's a myth that I want to bust this morning that is common in some people's thinking. And that myth is this, that we do not need the Old Testament anymore. That is a myth. See, people might say that the Old Testament, well, that's all done away with. Jesus came and he just completely wiped out the Old Testament. We could just cut it out of our Bibles and just have the New Testament and that's all we would ever need. Well that, my friends, is a myth. The Old Testament lays the foundation for the New. There's so much that we would not understand about Jesus, about his ministry, about the promises of God, about the need for salvation if it was not for the Old Testament laying that foundation. The Apostle Paul said that that I wouldn't even know what sin was if it wasn't for the law teaching me about sin. So the Old Testament is important. Now, we're not under the Old Covenant anymore. Jesus fulfilled that. But there is so much we can still learn from studying the Old Testament, as I hope we'll look at today, as we learn some, some, some things about God, or truths about God. So one thing great about the Old Testament, the Old Testament gives us literal pictures of spiritual realities. Literal pictures of spiritual realities. That means that the events that happened in the Old Testament have spiritual significance that sometimes we don't understand until the New explains it to us. And that's what the Exodus is. Now, on the surface, the Exodus might just be a story of God rescuing his people out of slavery. But as we're going to see, it actually points us to the greater need of all people to be rescued from the slavery of sin. And how Jesus Christ is that rescuer. So, there's a lot of great things we can learn today, but before we go much further, let's go ahead and turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for today, and we pray that as we get into your word, that you would speak to us, open it up, and you would be with us. Any person that needs to hear a message this morning, which I believe, Lord, is all of us, that you would speak to us through your word, and that we would be different because of it today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, like I said, we're starting with kind of an overview of Moses and the Exodus. And we're going to be looking at four truths about God that carry over to Easter. So the first uh, thing we're going to do is look at Exodus chapter 2. It'll be up on the screen above, but you can follow along if you have your Bibles. But I'll be, I'll be covering a lot of ground and jumping back and forth, so it uh, should be in your bowl if you want to look ahead to some of the scriptures. Genesis, or, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 2. Verse 23 through 25. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of the slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew so the first truth that we're going to look at, that we learn about God, that carries over to the Easter, is this. God hears the cries of his people. God hears the cries of his people. From the time that Israel first...
first entered into Egypt through Joseph, bringing them in. We looked at that story last week. 400 years has passed. Now, when we read the Bible, we go from Genesis chapter 50 to Exodus chapter 1, and we think there's not much time that's been covered, but 400 years has passed. And we're not given any indication that God spoke through other prophets or other people, other leaders during that time. So it's very possible that Israel would have experienced 400 years of silence. And that's a long time to not hear from God. In fact, it's interesting, this is just sort of a freebie I'll throw into the side. There's 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and Jesus' birth, too. And so we also have a little, a little glimpse of how this is similar to Easter in that way. 400 years can, sound, it can be a long time, it is a long time, to not hear from God. Let's say we all go through these periods where we feel like God isn't listening, or God isn't speaking to us. We wonder where God is. And the first thing that we see is that God does hear. Even if we don't see Him at work, even if we don't notice what He's doing, if we don't feel like He's responding the way that He should, God is listening to us. And when we cry out to Him, God hears our cries. In fact, He goes on to say in Exodus chapter 3, verse 9 through 15, Behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. This is God speaking to Moses. Moses said to God, But who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, But I will be with you, and this will be a sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. But then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. God said to Moses, say to this people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has sent me to you, and this is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. See, we learn that God hears the cries of His people, but we also know that God doesn't just hear, He responds. And how does He respond? This is the second truth that points us to Easter. He responds by sending a deliverer. God sends a deliverer to His people who are enslaved. Throughout the entire Bible, at different times, God raises up men and women to rescue His people. It's the entire book of Judges is full of these stories of God raising up deliverers and Moses as seen as the great deliverer of the Hebrew people. And look at how God empowers Moses to deliver Israel. He tells him, I will be with you. He promises his presence to Moses. He gives Moses the authority of his name. He says, I am who I am. What does that mean? Well, that is the salvational name of God. That is the name Yahweh. This is the first time that God has revealed this name to him. This is his salvational name. This is his covenantal name, meaning that he makes a covenant with this name with people. The name of Yahweh. And he says, I am giving you the power and the authority of my name to go to my people and speak on my behalf. God is raising up and empowering Moses. And how this points to Jesus is simply this. The name Jesus has great meaning. We talked about this before Christmas. The name Jesus means Yahweh saves. And just as Moses is given the authority of God's salvational name, Jesus came with that same name to save people from their sins. There is something powerful about giving your name to something. Now, I don't know about you, if any of you have kids, but my kids always like to name things. 
They named everything, every stuffed animal, every toy. My son, when he was little, he had all these stuffed animals, and they all had all these weird names. And it was, it was funny because they'd be like Hoppy Frog Parker or Bear, Green Berry Parker. And it, it was so funny because every name always ended with Parker. In fact, our cat is Fancy Ray Parker. <laughs> and every name that they gave, they always added the family name. And I think that's significant. Because when you give something your name, you are showing relationship. You are showing commitment. You are showing involvement. And when God gives Moses the authority and power of his name, he is showing that he is in relationship with his people and that he is committed to them by sending Moses. He is involved in their very needs and their very cries. Now Moses is the great deliverer, deliverer of the Hebrew people. But he says at the end of his life, there's one that will come after me that's even greater. And that person is Jesus. Jesus is the deliverer of all people. Not just the people of Israel. Jesus calls everyone to be saved. But as we know, not everyone who hears the message responds in a favorable way. Moses is sent to Pharaoh to bring this message of deliverance to say, let my people go. And Pharaoh doesn't take very well to it. Exodus chapter 11 verses 9 and 10 says, then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. See, Pharaoh received the message, but he rejected it. And this is the third truth we learn about God that applies to the Easter story, is that God punishes the hard-hearted. Now the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And honestly, this is kind of a difficult scripture. What does this mean that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. One is that God is the one who actually hardened Pharaoh's heart in order to use him as an example. I mean, he says that in the text there. He says, his heart will be hardened so that I can show my wonders to you. The second option is that Pharaoh chose to harden his own heart to reject God's warnings and harden his heart towards God because of that. And you know, I think it's a little bit of I think that Pharaoh certainly had the freedom and the free will to choose what he was going to do. But I think that God also had the foreknowledge to know that Pharaoh was going to reject him. And because of that, God was going to make an example of him and eat in the people of Egypt. I think that there are times that we, through our choices to sin, our choices of apathy, our choices of rejecting the call of God, we get so hardened towards God that even when God is moving in our lives, it hardens our heart. When God is reaching out to us, when God is speaking to us, because we don't want to hear it, our hearts become hard. And this is what happened to Pharaoh. Pharaoh rejected God and ten plagues were sent to Egypt. First he turns the water into blood. Then he sends a plague of frogs. Then lice and gnats. Then flies come. The fifth plague is the death of the, life, of the livestock. Six is boils that break out. Seven is hail coming down from heaven. Eight is locusts to destroy all the crops. Nine is darkness. And finally, ten is the death of the firstborn. And we'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks when we look at Passover and how Passover really plays a significant role in Easter. But for now, we know that Egypt suffered because of Pharaoh's hard heart. And you see, God is just. God will punish sin. As we mentioned last week, He's either going to punish sin on the cross or in hell. And we all have a choice to make. Do we want our sin to be taken by Jesus on the cross or do we want to be responsible for our own sin on the day of judgment? That's a choice each one of us has to make. 
God gives us all opportunities to repent and turn to Him, but sin does have consequences both in this world and in eternity. And when we have a hard heart, we become less and less sensitive to the work of God in our lives. And what's tricky about a hard heart is that we often don't see it coming. When our hearts get hard, it's often a gradual change. It's not something that immediately turns on us. So I think that we need to be aware of things that are causing us to have a hard heart and maybe some of the symptoms that we might be showing. Carrie Newhoff is a Christian minister and leadership consultant. He, he writes uh, many blogs and, and does many podcasts about church leadership. And he says this on his website. He calls this the early warning signs of a hard heart. So this is something we can all maybe embrace and look at in ourselves. Early warning signs of a hard heart. Number one, you don't really celebrate and you don't really cry. You don't really celebrate and you don't really cry. You might put on a show on the outside, but in your heart, you're just numb. You're not really celebrating, you're not really crying. Number two, you stop genuinely caring. <clears throat> really doesn't have to say much more than that. When you stop caring about people, about life, about consequences, your heart is getting hard. Number three, so much of what is supposed to be meaningful feels mechanical. From your personal friendships to family, to work, to coming to church, to worship, the things that are supposed to be meaningful, it's just like going through the motions to them. Number four, passion is hard to come by for anything. You just don't get excited about things. And number five, you no longer believe the best about people. When you meet someone, you start to think about what's going to go wrong or what's not going right. You stop looking for the good in others or in situations. And if you're dealing with any of those, it, it might be time to have a heart check. Maybe your heart's gotten hard and you don't realize it. You see, hard hearts need to be broken. And that can be painful. That's what Pharaoh had to experience. His hard heart needed to be broken. But no one is beyond hope. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today... If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Today, right now, if you hear his voice, if God is speaking to you through his word, through the Holy Spirit, do not harden your hearts. Do not reject it. Do not fight it as you did when you were rebellious towards him. Confess your sin. Repent of your rebellion. Turn to God. Own your past. Admit that you're wrong. That's hard. I don't like to admit that I'm wrong. When I get my mind made up about something, you cannot convince me otherwise. I mean, you can ask a lot of the arguments that my wife and I have. It's because I think I'm right and I wasn't. I thought I knew where something was and I didn't. I thought I understood something and I was wrong. And when I'm faced with those facts, my reaction, my human reaction, is to say, well, uh, I just didn't know. Or, well, somebody moved it. Or to come up with whatever excuse I can come up with so that I can justify myself. But here's the thing. We can't justify ourselves before God. We need Christ to do that. And we have to come to Him and we have to repent and confess our sins and admit that we are wrong. Is there anything that you're fighting God about today? You see, stubbornness towards God is an indicator of the heart. So today, if your hearts are hardened, hear His voice. Return to Him. Pharaoh had to learn the hard way, but you do not have to. The fourth reality we're going to learn about to God today is this. Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 and 41.
The time of the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from Egypt. <clears throat> God calls his people out of slavery to freedom. After 430 years of being in bondage in Egypt, God called them out. He set them free. And he calls each one of us to freedom from our slavery. The Exodus is a beautiful picture of what Christ does to anyone who believes. Israel was in the land of slavery, but all people are enslaved to sin. Moses delivered them out of Egypt, and Jesus delivers you from your sin. And salvation is offered to all who believe in Jesus, not just to a certain group of people. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 says, You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Today, if you hear his voice, God is calling you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I love that verse because those of us who are still trapped in sin are walking in darkness. I don't think that it's a coincidence that before the Tenth plague, the ninth plague was darkness. The entire land of Egypt was covered in darkness. And they needed to be delivered from it. God is calling you out of that darkness today. And by His great mercy, you and I have the opportunity to be His people and to be set free. And so the question we have to ask each of ourselves is this Are we really free? Because if you're like me, and you read about this, and you talk about freedom and all this, you might think, wait a minute, Scott, I, this is 2019. I'm an American. I live in this great country. I, I've never been a slave to anyone or to anything. I don't really grasp this concept of being set free. Well, if that's your thought, if that idea has gone through your mind, you're in good company. Because Jesus' first listeners had that same reaction to him as well. <clears throat> Look how Jesus handles this very discussion about who is really enslaved and who needs to be set free. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But they answered to him, We're offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say that you will become free? See, they're thinking physically. But Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus says, Every single one of us, no matter what your physical condition is, has been enslaved to sin. And those of us who still struggle with sin, who practice sin, we're hanging on to that slavery. And Jesus says, you know what? I've come to set you free. And if I set you free, you will be free indeed. And that's what he calls each one of us to. And the Exodus foreshadows it. The Exodus shows a people that were in darkness, that were needed to be delivered from slavery. God sends a deliverer, Moses, to them. He leads them out. That's what we're looking at in a couple weeks. He leads them into the wilderness because these people needed to learn to be God's people. They were so used to their ways in Egypt that they longed for the false gods. They longed for the slavery. And God had to train them to be his people through discipline in the wilderness. And he leads them through the Red Sea. And that's a picture of us submitting to God through baptism. Paul talks about that. And he leads them into the promised land. And that promised land is the hope that each one of us can have. Not of a physical home in this world, but of an eternal home in heaven. And so Exodus lays the groundwork. Exodus gives us that foundation that we can build upon. And as we head towards Easter, I hope 
we can see the significance of these things and realize that God is calling each one of us to freedom. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And that that light overcomes the darkness. So Lord, may your light shine on us in the areas of darkness that we may still hold on to. And may we give those to you. May we surrender. May our hearts be softened and in some cases, may be broken. And may you speak to us and shape us into the people you've called us to be. So God, please forgive us, strengthen us, and guide us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.